add additional added value, additional revenue streams. Yes. Very good. So I've been around here for a while. Yeah. Might be able to knock out a couple of these with just a quick reminder of how the economics of the system works. Sure, absolutely. Let's help, help the audience. Let, let's start you off. Okay, knock out some of these. <laughs> cool. Uh, so just a reminder of how the live piece of economics work. Um, initially, there was a supply of uh, 10 million tokens of Genesis as part of our decentralization roadmap. We talked about decentralization ownership, and we distributed it initially, largely as part of the Merkle mine algorithm, but also to some early contributors, um, and providers of capital, and we'll talk about that. Uh, that 10 million tokens was just the Genesis state of the network. As an improvement of the state of the network, you need some token in order to begin to participate. But you know, over the past five years, the token distribution, four years, the token distribution's really been ongoing through participation in the network. And the um, incentives in the network are all about rewarding active participation. So rewarding those who run nodes, rewarding those who stake towards those running nodes to provide kind of quality assurance services and wrap work on the network. Uh, and there's been did we pass 25 million recently? Or is there, do we have 15 million new tokens uh, that have been minted since the dawn of the network that have all gone to people who are actively participating? So really it's an ongoing distribution. Now the, the mechanism is if you want to do work on this network, you stake LPC. You're supposed to be able to do an amount of work that's roughly proportional to how much LPC you stake we can talk about whether that is not correct, incorrect, what it led to. Uh, and then you would earn inflationary LPT. So if you're participating, you're earning this newly minted LPT. It's how you bootstrap the network. It's, it's a little speculative, um, especially in the early days. Uh, but you also earn the real kind of utility-based fees that users of this network pay in ETH. And the notion is, again, let's say you have staked 1% of the tokens on this network, you would earn 1% of the fees. Um, but if the usage grows and that 1% goes from being worth you know, $100 a week to $1,000 a week to a $1 million a week, you can see how 1% of the life of your token become worth a lot more meter than if you want in order to do more work or earn those, earn those fees. Uh, so you know, the value of the token, it has utility, it provides security through staking, there's some governance impacts and whatnot. But uh, you know it's really driven by the increased usage of the network and fees. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll cut in here. So, so you, you talked about the inflation of the token. Uh, let's go into the fees. You talked about the fees and how they're you know, relative. Why ETH fees and why not something else? Yeah. So um, initially, um, we had thought about ETH being a line pure token. That's a good question. Should it be? I think there's arguments for it potentially being a line pure token. Uh, the theoretical thinking here, and debatable how this plays out in practice, is that fees are a high velocity cycle, like a high velocity of money. And what that means is you're investing in infrastructure, you're running GPUs, you're running bandwidth, you have a cost, right? And everyone is pricing their work in a marketplace and how much they want to charge. And because it's this global marketplace, there's a lot of competition. The prices are going to get driven down for transcoding pretty close to your cost of operating, right? You might be able to make a little margin, great. Uh, but what you need to do is you need to essentially like liquidate the fees that you earn or a portion of them in order to cover your cost. And the users need to acquire some digital asset to pay for this network. So the cycle is very high velocity. As I'm a broadcaster, I buy a bunch of, if it was LPT, I buy LPT. I pay it into the network for transcoding. The person who receives it, receives it, they immediately need to sell it, who are they selling it to? They're selling it back to the broadcaster. And it's this like high velocity cycle that doesn't actually accrue any value uh, to the token. Theoretically, you could debate maybe it's not that high velocity, maybe it, it could. But when you're bootstrapping a product, a project, there's actually, you know, there's no liquidity sources for LPT, so it's hard to come by. Uh, ETH is already in everyone's wallets, being a theory ecosystem project that kind of mobilizes to all Ethereum wallets. Uh, it's far more liquid, it's easier to, to buy, it might hold for other purposes. Do the, oh, it's actually creating a barrier for users to have to find LPT in order to try this network. 
Um, these users are building apps that touch lots of different Ethereum ecosystem projects. Uh, let's use does everyone, does, does, does everyone here know how ETH works as payments in the, the network? Like, are, are they familiar with how the staking works with the trend, with the, uh, the LPT, and then the ETH gets paid to it? Does, does, it, does anyone want me, I can visualize it real quick, if that would help. Does that make sense? You know, I'll do it real quick, um, just because I think it's, it's important for people to understand. So, type node, I'm type node, I run an orchestrator node, so, so this, is, this is my node. Um, we'll call me a transcoder. So I transcode video. Um, this here is a, a delegator, this is a, an LPT holder, okay? So LPT, and say they have a bunch of LPT, and over here you have a broadcaster who um, has video. So this, this person wants to transfer their video, okay? Well, someone can delegate their LPT to me. So basically, they're just pointing the LPT. Um, if I have, say, um, 100 LPT, and this other transcoder has 50 LPT, arguably, you'd say, I'm, I've been voted as being a little more trustworthy than this transcoder. So the broadcaster sends their video to me, I transcode it, but with the video, they also send the ETH as payment, right? Uh, I spelled that wrong. Um, this, so they, they send the ETH as payment with their video. It gets transcoded and sent back, okay? So there's this relationship between broadcasters and transcoders, or orchestrators, it's the same thing in this case, um, where they send the ETH, we do the work, we send it back, and then I split some of those fees with my delegator. So ETH also flows into the pockets of a delegator, right? So there's like this, this model where we can, we can securely make sure that people are getting what they want, which is high quality transcoding. They pay in ETH and it gets sent to delegators as well as transcoders for, for, for producing this work, okay? And then in, in, in doing so, LPT also gets minted every day for people participating in the network. Does that make sense, everyone? Anyone have any questions about this model? Love this. Can you just then map on the inflationary rewards and how that works and then go back to delegators? Okay, so every day, orchestrators have the opportunity to what's called call reward, which is they mint brand new inflationary tokens, okay? These inflationary tokens get split between the, the transcoder and the delegator, and on the explorer, you'll see what their fee cuts are. So just for ease of example, let's say that they have their uh, fee cut or the reward cut set at 50%, and on 100 new tokens, they mint, say, 1% for the day. That means you get 0.5 LPT goes here, 0.5 LPT goes here, and those are the inflationary tokens, okay? So these inflationary tokens build up over time and they're a reward for participating in the voting mechanism for who is trusted to actually do the work. Because we've got to trust someone or something to not send back incorrect transcoded data because at the end of the day, if the broadcaster gets screwed, well then no one's gonna use that here, right? So we need to incentivize that. The idea is also, if this person does bad work. We can slash. We can slash their LPT. They go down on the leaderboard. They leave, and they get removed from the ecosystem. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. I just wanted to cover that. Just to give a visual. Yeah, it might be a good opportunity to answer the question: like, how much inflation is there? How how many LPT are minted? Uh, this is interesting and related to all the incentives being tied to participation. So. What we say is that uh, there's an inflation rate right now, it's probably around, maybe Nico knows better, it's around eight or nine percent uh, right now per year. And so, well, I think it's, it's 17-ish. That's the rewards that you get. Because, yeah, because that, that eight or nine percent on the network uh, only goes to those who are staked and participating. And so only 50% of the tokens are staked and participating. So your kind of returns are actually double that amount. You're, gro you're, you're growing your ownership by 18, 19% uh, per year right now. And our, our network actually 
targets 50% participation. So if we have less than 50% of the total state, every day the inflation rate rises a little bit to incentivize more people to join. Uh, and if less, if more than 50% of the state, it actually drops the inflation rate and kind of you know, reduces the dilution that we've been taking. Uh, and it just it varies every single day. And that's we found an equilibrium. We've been hovering right around 50% for the last year or so. So, so the ether in, uh, the fees are in ETH, um, and I think in the original white paper they were, you know, there was a proposition of stable coins and stuff. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and, and maybe what we could add or why we wouldn't or would add? Yeah, I think um, fees and stable coins, now that stable coins have proliferated, would make things easier on everyone. You can price transcoding in a stable you know, dollars and cents uh, as opposed to this volatile ETH thing where you don't know how much you should be paying for an hour of video. Uh, so that'd be great. I also think it'd be awesome to open up the discussion about including different types of token, maybe especially if we, if we go cross chain and support other chain ecosystems. Uh, you know, what would orchestrator be willing to accept? And should LPT be a, a payment? Would that actually be simplified? I think now that there's liquidity in kind of a its own ecosystem, if people have opinion, you know, a pretty strong opinion about that, then not feel free to add it now. Does anyone think that the token itself should be used as a payment and have an idea why we should do that? Go ahead, Nico. I think so because I do think ETH kind of sits outside of the Lightyear ecosystem. And even though that the demand side currently doesn't capture, wouldn't capture a lot of value if, if the payments would be LPT, the velocity is also kind of maybe a design decision there. So if you can alter the design to like, Capture more value for the demand side, it might actually be worth having fees in, more, in a token more native to the protocol. Right. So, one example would be to like solve liquidity. So, you can have a resource for the broadcasters in liquidity pool tokens between LPT and a stable coin, and then the actual uh, deposits to pay for the, uh, for the video transfer could be then in a stable coin, and then you have the benefit of, for example, having liquidity as well as stable payments. And that like aligning thing is interesting. So if, if broadcasters or applications do need to get LPT uh, in order to network, they actually become holders of LPT, they become more interested in uh, the success of the network more broadly, not just their use case and may contribute in other ways. So that's a good yeah. An interesting thought, like we talk about using a stable coin fees or LPT fees. Interesting to think about it as like they're both ERC twenty tokens. Like as an orchestrator, I might want to sort of advertise which currencies I'm willing to be paid in, which ERC twenty token contracts are you able to pay me in, and I price my my streams in that. And it's a blows the whole thing off it, but in some ways it doesn't it doesn't try to force everyone down the same route, but gives people the opportunity to choose their own route and kind of go it alone. So I think that's an interesting option. Uh, well, I think one additional interesting thing, which if you use LPT for two, if you use LPT as a key token, it's, I think it's easier for an orchestrator to like control their financial exposure because they're already exposed to LPT, like by default, they're exposed to LPT. Um, right now, they're also exposed to ETH as well. Like, yes, they can sell immediately, but you're only reducing the time horizon of exposure, but you're exposed no matter what. So, I think one nice thing is that by default, if you're only exposed to a single asset, that makes things a little bit difficult for the more financially minded people. Um, the other interesting thing is just also because we were talking about token distribution, but if these are paid in LPT, the broadcasters become a token distribution mechanism in, in, in and in itself, right? Because um, how they craft jobs on the network becomes the way that we redistribute ownership on the network because they basically say that I have a pool of funds and yes, I'm paying you, but I'm also kind of distributing, redistributing ownership on the network based on how you're performing on the service you're giving. So I think there's like two additional interesting things to consider. Cool. Just on that, like being able to receive fees and having to go directly to the bonded state, that would be kind of neat. Yeah, the little early orchestrators ask for that too. They ask if they can have like half of the fees be just put into their state because they're like, well, otherwise I have to go all the way out of the bag and buy yeah. the company again. So I see probably 10 people ask for that. Um, but it's, it's curious that this is an actual. Yeah. So, so I'm actually of the opinion 
the market share should be able to specify what ERC20 token they receive new payments in. Because in, like, in, in theory, like you said, though, it's an extremely high velocity of money, and orchestrators should theoretically have an extremely low time preference, regardless of what currency they're receiving. Like, e even if, if they choose to keep it in ETH, that's more a reflection of their decision to keep it in ETH, rather than a reflection of the underlying time preference. And it's, it's, so, so in that case, is if, if I say like, okay, this new DAO that I really believe in has, has this token, and 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 I want to accept it and keep in that token, great. Or alternatively, I can accept it and instantly dump it on the market and and, and move it to a stable coin. So, so like the, the, the currency itself shouldn't impact the the, the fees, right? Like. But and that, and that said, there's there's a disincentive which there's some miners or all of the people who transfer out of my here that your like a, a mining behavior is as soon as you receive a reward you immediately sell it. So you have to consider that like you, you probably don't want like the bottom twenty five percent of all the users to be like liquidating the whole ball of their own team and then driving the price down and it's a larger thing with guys as a deep is like you know, you're rolling with you guys only There's a, a, a lot of these like theoretical discussions will lead us to one great design, and then there's this great like practical consideration on the other end of the spectrum, which is like user experience is actually like one of the most important things that drives uh, you know adoption and, and usability here. And so it'd be like really powerful to think about like what's the user experience you can create that makes sense, that makes it easy to program clients and node software and stuff that also allows for you know accepting any token or pricing in various currencies, how you know, to be able to negotiate, you know, are you integrating with DEXs and Oracle services for USD price tags and software, like all of these, you know, are also inputs that have gone into driving some of the decisions you that work to create an appropriate world. Mm. Yeah, because as complexity goes up, everything becomes a little harder and could be harder for no real good reason. But that aside, I think, you know, right now, fees are in ETH, so you pay the e, you pay for transcoding or in ETH. It's currently how this system is. As an orchestrator myself, I like it. I like it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I like ETH. I'm bullish on it. Uh, it's a great thing. It's, it's, I like it. Um, okay, let's move on a little bit. I want to want to touch a little bit on additional revenue streams because this, I think this is an interesting topic. What if right now live here uh, it does. You get, you get paid for transcoding. What other additional revenue streams could there be, um, or can there be? Like, what have you? What thought process um, would you put into that? Yeah, when you when you look at the network today, this global network of GPUs, the thing that is best suited to like immediately bolt on are these additional forms of video compute. So things like the content recognition, the scene detection, things that are like critical for building a social application where you need moderation and curation of content. Uh, our network's already very well suited to do it, and these are very high value tasks. Like I think, what does um, Google's uh, scene classification API charge, like $9 an hour per stream or something like that? Uh, or just even doing like a thousand still images and detecting whether a certain type of content or not is, yeah, tens of dollars, right? So it's, uh, that's a big thing. Potential revenue stream. Uh, I think that you get into more challenges on like the productization and demand side. So like, how do we like our network can do that, but how do you actually onboard those dollars, those demand, and how do you enable application developers to use it? And that's where you get into this sort of balance between like, well, the demand all exists in the Web two world. We need to plug into their existing tools and make it easy to use. But we're building for the future of this Web three world where people are going to build killer, you know. Web through social and creator economy applications, but there's no scale and fees there yet. So you're, you're kind of like walking in this fine line of like creating these revenue streams that keep our great network of orchestrators happy and engaged and grooving every day uh, while building for this future world that's going to break out and power 10 million user applications, but in a quick period. Yeah. Um, I wrote down sustainability, but I realized it basically just means cost of transcoding because this isn't. Idea I had. I brought up this in the water cooler chat, and it was basically around this concept of um, if 
the, the, the cost at which transcoders are willing to do the work, and what does that mean for uh, the growth of the network, um, not in minutes of video transcoded, but in fees transcoded. Um, and so, in Titan Mode Pool specifically, I, we, have a, we have a pool, transcoders, people are connected, and some people are willing to transcode for like something $8 a month. Uh, they don't seem to care. They, as long as they can make $8 a month when they're, they're like 16 years old in their parents' basement, they are just happy. <laughs> and they're doing maybe hundreds or even thousands of dollars of transcoding compared to Amazon, right? And so my concern is not only does it gobble up Amazon because it becomes 50x cheaper and it just becomes an easy decision, but it then gobbles up itself because it's so effective and you have price wars in live peer almost pushing down. What can you say on the, pro the cost of transcoding, the, the competition within the network, and its uh, sustainability? Not to throw you, it's a hard question. Right? This, is not, this is not a question for me, this is a question for Mr. Market, right? Like this is where the market will determine whatever that like margin is that you know, there's going to be a curve between capacity available at price X, and as X goes higher, you're going to see more capacity available, and as X goes lower, and there's less capacity available. Uh, but I don't think, I don't think like we in this room get to like set that price or make it up or anything. I think you can ensure that there are like LPT incentives that can underbalance some of the maybe lack of money on the transport itself. Uh, but the only way I think the market kind of decides that. That price. It sounds like Alex, you probably have some strong opinions here. What you yeah, like, well, all I'd say in one of the market is that uh, as long as bandwidth costs something and isn't free, I feel like the price is reasonable. And what's interesting is, at least with live here, uh, exascalers that basically do have access to free bandwidth perform orders kind of to lower than like, individuals or like, So, like, state, for instance, is not even in the top. Like, they're already low screeners, maybe, um, and they have the capital for how many care about the bandwidth cost. So, fortunately, it's, it's working to this country. What was the term you said? Exascalers? Uh, exas yeah, so basically, like, someone who has enough money to like build a data center that's like 200,000 square feet. Um, like, this happened with Chia because there were a lot of companies that have petabytes or exabytes of hard drive space. So, to them, the cost of energy is basically zero, whereas like, individual contributors are still buying up hard drives to the farm. And so the cost is very different for those two like, groups of computers. And it's cool because in with the library you said has that like distinction is not really played out. Yeah. You actually see like three of the big actors like Coinbase, Kraken, and Binance, right, are not actually top performing transcoders or competitive for fees relative to uh, you know, many of the more indie, indie operations, if you will, that are optimizing around this stuff. Um, and you're starting to see that shift in all the workflow there. And, you know, over time, you see the, the specialists that know how to work in life here, um, you know, figure out in the market like where that quality of service margin is. I, I would also add with regards to cost of transcoding is that, as, so as Doug pointed out with the additional revenue streams, and transcoding is only one part of this this larger compute world. So even if if like even if the cost has decreases to a point that it creates a really challenging scenario for people on one end of, of the economies of scale, uh, you you still have this this frontier of other compute functions, and then the competition can simply move there. And, and I think that frontier will continue to to expand. Mm, good point. services, origin services, seeding peer and peer CDNs, like those are all things that you know, factor much really differently. Like what's my 24 7 uptime? It's my connectivity uh, up and right down. So, yeah. Cool. We got about five more minutes. Young, you have a comment? Uh, I'll, I'll keep this brief, but I think it's, and maybe we can talk about this separately, but I think it's also an interesting thing to think about the cost of transcoding from the point of view of, so right now, transcoding is metered on the network, so you pay for transcoding usage. And that's like fundamentally important as like a default way to pay on the network. I think it'd be interesting in the future to also think about a 
based on the way like, things are being monetized in Web3, as there are additional revenue streams, how those could influence how you pay for infrastructure services as well. So for example, in the Filecoin ecosystem, something interesting that we've seen happen is that a lot of Filecoin miners are charging zero. So they, they push their price down to zero, so they're not actually earning anything for storage, but it's because uh, there is this mechanism called Popcorn Plus where basically from certain types of clients, if they accept the storage work, they get a boost in their uh, block rewards. So it's just like an alternative way to pay for the service. And I'm not saying that we should do that in live here, but just highlighting that um, there's an interesting design space there in addition to like the meter per usage of transcoding that as we see more applications and more monetization strategies in virtual space, that may or may not influence how we think about how things are paid for. One last topic before we, we end. I, I will get to inflation real quick. Um, in, so right now, the, the economic model of LPT is uh, infinitely inflationary. There is no cap. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about why that was chosen and what what the idea is behind that? Yeah, I don't I don't think the way to think about um, live here is about like how many tokens are there. Um, and how many will there, will there be? Um, I think the way to think about it is like defending or growing your percent ownership stake in this network. Uh, because if you, you know, like I, I gave the example of 1%, if you have 1% of the tokens on the network and you stake them and participate, you will never, uh, you'll always own 1% or more of the network. You'll never be diluted through the issuance of additional token, as long as you're acting honestly, not being slashed, um, et cetera. And so uh, really it's about kind of like defending and growing that ownership position, which is, you know, there is a fixed high. There's 100% of the live peer network, which gives you access to 100% of the fees that flow through the live peer network, right? And like that's the fixed thing, not the amount of the token, uh, which is sort of a, an arbitrary thing. A side effect of this is like in the early days, the live peer token was highly inflationary. Like it was, it was over 100% a year, I think, uh, you know, return for participants. Side effect of that is like, that's a lot of dilution. Like you'd expect the token price to go down, but you don't mind if it goes down by 30% if you're actually doubling your amount of token, it's, it's worth more, right? And so it was all about incentives that target this participation for like a healthy video network that'll be worth more and more as there's more fees, more so than like uh, trying to grow the value in one individual live peer token. Cool. And any last comments um, before we wrap up? Just the demand side. The demand side? Do you wanna, you wanna cover that real quick? So yeah, for the economics conversation, I think the context is how can we incentivize the demand side in order to uh, build on live peer and make them owners in live peer? Really good and important question. Like I think that we need to think deeply about that as a community and, and address it, right? Like one way is inflation funding. That's somebody's building can just run a node, they can say build this application, hang around it. People should stake towards them, allow them to keep a reward cut and grow ownership in LPT. But that works, it might not work, it's a little altruistic. Uh, our grants a better mechanism, should there be a protocol change where people actually like, vote to route funding from the protocol to these uh, demand side projects? So it's a good, good discussion that we need to have. Very good. And um, I think Chris said tweaks the protocol. Is that what, you, is that what your topic was? Yeah, like maybe I can just crystallize it from the last point. Do you ever imagine people staking towards the broadcaster and sharing the fees that a broadcaster might make? And the broadcaster also calling reward like an orchestrator does? And I'm just thinking how to tweak that in the demand side. I'm just if it's something you've ever seen. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think that's sim that's like almost the same as what I described, where like that broadcaster could run an orchestrator node and attract stake, not to transcode, but just to it's fundraise, true. yeah, for their uh, their project, essentially. But maybe just making it direct staking towards broadcaster short right. circuits that. We're running yeah. GPUs doing our transcoding, but distributing right. content. And, right. and, and, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. Yeah. So. Great, I'd like to give a big round of applause to Dan for joining us. <laughs> We're a few minutes over, so my apologies to the next panelists. Um, I believe, is it, who's up next? 
Yeah, yeah. Is, this, this is not going to be a panel per se. This is going to a be a very interactive and engaging. 